Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's book launch. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Carsi Ramos. I am an assistant professor of sociology and justice studies at Rhode Island College and uh, a consultant with Cardozo Law's uh, Institute in Holocaust and Human Rights on their Confronting Structural Violence project. And I have the distinct pleasure of uh, being the moderator for this exciting event today. So uh, I just want to go through a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, we will be, uh, this is a webinar format, as you know, and so we will be taking questions through the chat. So if at any point during uh, the presentation, uh, at the earlier discussions, you have a question, please just put it in the chat. Uh, and when we get to uh, the Q&A portion of uh, today's event, I will go through uh, and ask those, ask those questions. Um, and hopefully you will all have many. Um, I also just wanna give a quick overview of more or less what today will look like. Um, I will, in just a moment, introduce our wonderful panel, uh, after which the author will give a, a, a brief introduction and some remarks. Uh, and then our two other panelists uh, will give remarks and have a, a discussion amongst themselves. And then we will open up the floor uh, for a uh, broader uh, discussion in which we hope that you all participate. So I'll begin by introducing the panel. Um, first, we have Dr. Alette Smulos. She is a professor of criminal law and criminology of international crimes at the Faculty of Law of the University of Groningen, as well as the University College Groningen in the Netherlands. She holds a PhD uh, from Maastricht University and her research focuses on international crimes, such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and other gross human rights violations, as well as terrorism. In her research, Dr. Smirnus focuses on the causes of international crimes and terrorism, the perpetrators of international crimes and the criminal prosecution of these crimes. She is the author of many journal articles and co-editor of Perpetrators of International Crimes, Theories, Methods and Evidence, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2019. Besides being one of the co-chairs of the European Criminology Group on Atrocity Crimes and Transitional Justice, she is also on the advisory board of the journal Perpetrator Research and editor of the book series Supranational, Supranational sorry, Criminal Law, Capital Selecta of Intersentia, as well as the editor of International Criminal Law Review. And we are incredibly thankful that she is joining us today. Next, we have Dr. Scott Strauss, he is Villas Distinguished Achievement Professor of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the United States. He holds a PhD from Berkeley and works on violence, human rights, and African politics. He is one of the leading researchers on the Rwandan genocide, as well as on perpetrators, and is the author of Making and Unmaking Nations, War, Leadership, and Genocide in Modern Africa, as well as The Order of Genocide, Race, Power, and War in Rwanda, both published by Cornell University Press in 2015 and 2006, respectively. He is also the editor of the University of Wisconsin Press Critical Human Rights Series. And prior to his academic career, Dr. Strauss was a freelance journalist in Africa. And last but certainly not least, and the reason that we are all uh, here today, uh, Dr. Timothy Williams is a junior professor of insecurity and social order at the Bundeswehr University Munich in Germany. He holds a PhD from Marburg University and his research deals with violence, focusing on its dynamics, particularly at the micro level, as well as its consequences for post-conflict societies and the politics of memory these evoke, particularly in Cambodia and more recently in Rwanda. Besides publishing in various journals, he has also co-edited a volume on perpetrators with Susanna Buckley Zistel, um, published by Rutledge in 2018, and has authored the book of this launch, The Complexity of Evil, Perpetration and Genocide, uh, which has been published by Rutgers University Press. He's also a section editor of the Journal of Perpetrator Studies and an executive board member of the Interna International Association of Genocide Scholars. So once again, welcome you all to what promises to be 
uh, an exciting discussion. And without further ado, we will get started. Uh, and so I will turn this over to um, Dr. Tim Williams. Thank you so much, Kasi. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, everyone who's uh, joining uh, today um, uh, to discuss this new book. I'm very excited. Um, thank you to Scott and Alette also um, for, for joining and discussing the book. And uh, before I get started, and I'll be very brief in introducing the book, I would like to uh, very briefly short and shortly thank uh, Susanna Knittel for co-organizing uh, this book launch series uh, with me um, to um, uh, to many people in Cambodia who made this uh, research possible. First and foremost, though, Kiao Dong, um, a colleague who uh, I am now working again with in Munich, uh, and to uh, my wonderful colleagues at the University of Marburg, uh, first and foremost, Susanna buckley uh, who were instrumental to writing this book, and to the many other people I've worked with since uh, during this long publication process who have given a lot of emotional and uh, uh, conceptual support uh, for, for what came out of this. Um, in the book, uh, what I've tried to do is um, approach the question, the very broad question, of why people participate uh, in genocide. And in response to the, that question, I uh, develop a systematic model, um, which is relatively abstract, um, but which I hope is useful for explaining participation across various different cases. Um, uh, it takes uh, Arendt's uh, notion of the banality of evil as this, uh, this iconic phrase, as it were, uh, and uh, while I echo the break uh, from an interpretation uh, of a psychopath and, or ideological fanatism being wrong, um, and I agree uh, with the idea that, uh, to quote Arendt, uh, perpetrators are terribly and terrifyingly normal. This is relatively common in perpetrator research today. What differentiates this book is that I take up this notion of the complexity of evil to argue that motivations are, yes, uh, very often banal, but they're also manifold and complex. And with the model, what I try and do is differentiate causally between different types of um, factors that can impact someone's decision to participate in genocide. Um, and thus give a more nuanced and complex picture. Um, but at the same time, while there are many different factors and they have different types of ways in which they work causally, um, they in and of themselves are very often relatively simple and everyday motivations. There's obviously been a lot of work um, on this topic of why people participate in genocide before, with e really excellent work on uh, particularly the Rwandan genocide, also the Holocaust, individual work on Cambodia, Bosnia and Armenia too. Plus, there's been a lot of work uh, in various different disciplines, uh, looking at it from a more conceptual point of view, social psychology, political science, uh, sociology, particularly organizational sociology, and um, criminology. But very often, the cases don't speak to each other, and even the disciplines uh, in this very interdisciplinary field don't necessarily speak to each other. And so the idea was to try and synthesize these, to try and bring these together and see how we can uh, create a, a framework to understand perpetration, which draws on the insights from these different, um, these different sources. And so in the end, I come up with, a, with an abstract, systematic, causally ordered uh, model, which I think can be used as a heuristic um, for us to understand better how individual per people, individuals become perpetrators. Now, in the book, I'm going to very briefly share my screen again. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to. <laughs> um, uh, it, basically, it, uh, the book centers around uh, the complexity of evil model. Um, and uh, here we go. Um, and in the model, this obviously, it looks quite complex. I mean, that's the um, <laughs> name of the model. But it, what's really important is that it differentiates between motivations, facilitative factors, and contextual conditions. And motivations are the key. They're what make people do what they do. It's the impetus for, for action. And I differentiate here between in-group motivations, which are dynamics within the perpetrator group, 
either to do with peers or to do with um, uh, with uh, people in positions of authority uh, or status or taking on a role within that group. Um, then there are motivations which are focused on the victim group, um, the outgroup motivations, an emotional response to the victims or ideological um, uh, ide uh, ideas and motivations. Uh, although we'll get back to ideology in a second, uh, because I would argue that it's mostly not a motivation for people to participate in genocide. And then there are opportunistic motivations, which mean that the perpetrator has some reason to believe that they will benefit from participating, be it uh, economic, be it through personal relationships, uh, uh, the excitement they gain from it, or career perspectives. But and. This is a key differentiation which is not made in the literature so far between motivations and what I call facilitative factors. So factors which um, make it uh, easier to participate, make it more likely to be, uh, for someone to participate, but aren't actually in and of themselves enough. And here ideological um, mo uh, factors are, are, are key. Um, they create an environment in which uh, it becomes justifiable, legitimate uh, to participate. Uh, but uh, many other factors uh, work here as well. Uh, dehumanization, uh, morally disengaging uh, from, uh, from the victim group through distancing, or group dynamics in which uh, responsibility is dissipated within the group or deflected uh, to an authority figure. And then this is all embedded within a larger uh, genocidal context, which makes many of the actions even possible and even thinkable. Um, so this is basically what 90% uh, of the book is about. Uh, is uh, If you go through the book, it's mostly just uh, looking at the various elements of that model. Um, but like I said, it draws on all these different disciplines and different um, cases. But what it also has in there is um, data that I collected during my field work uh, in Cambodia. I spent six months uh, in Cambodia in 2014 and 2015 um, and interviewed 48 former Khmer Rouge, uh, some of them or many of them multiple times uh, in in-depth interviews. And it was these insights from those interviews uh, that together with the 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 broader insights from the literature I've married into this more uh, and larger um, uh, model. And so I hope that with this model, um, people will be able to go out and um, look at individual perpetrators and look at specific cases which haven't been studied so far, and will have a heuristic, will have a framework with, within which they can approach perpetrators motivations and understand them. It's not designed as a predictive model. It, Possibly it could be developed as such, but as such, it's meant to understand um, perpetrators uh, in in the actions that they've they've already um, committed. Um, now uh, I'll I'll uh, stop talking there, and I look forward to the rest of our discussions. And I am muted. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, just before we turn this over to our panelists, I, I wanted to remind you or to say to those who are just joining um, that if you have questions uh, that you would like to pose to either um, the author or to either of our panelists, please go ahead and put them in um, the chat feature as they come up. Uh, and so uh, now I will turn this over to um, Alet Smuras and um, she will give us her remarks. Okay, thank you uh, very much for uh, the invitation of uh, being here and uh, commenting on the, on the book. I uh, read the book with, uh, with great interest and uh, I think uh, Timothy managed to give a great and excellent overview of uh, the current literature and the different positions of uh, different people and places himself well in the uh, debate. And indeed, as he said, uh, the book is um, centered around the uh, schematic uh, model he made and he showed and the book, in fact, explains this, uh, this whole model, which uh, he does in a very uh, clear uh, and, and ex excellent way and kind of focuses very much on um, 
on the different motives of, uh, of people. So I very much enjoyed the book and I can absolutely recommend it to, to others. He distinguished between uh, motivations, facilitating factors and uh, context, which I think is a very good uh, distinction. Um, so uh, in that sense, it's, it's uh, absolutely uh, very helpful. Um, I wondered while reading the book, and uh, I'm not 100% sure yet whether the list of factors is, is exhaustive, but I must admit reading the book, I couldn't find any factors that were, were still missing, because ev even if they weren't explicitly mentioned, then they were still part of another uh, factor. Um, the one thing related to the scheme is that uh, what I did wonder is the, uh, the facilitating uh, factors that were uh, mentioned. Um, in, in the scheme you showed before, you could clearly see it, that it seems that you suggest that it starts off with the um, motivations. And that is one point where I wonder if that is totally true. You do absolutely say that there is a context in which these crimes occur. And then you mentioned a lot of different types of uh, motives uh, and clearly show uh, that there's an interrelation uh, between the two. Um, but then my question is, you, you put the facilitating factors in, uh, in the last part. And I wonder whether that is, uh, whether it isn't the, the, the opposite, whether for instance, the, the motivation of being obedient doesn't uh, follow from the fact that someone is within a specific uh, organization and there is a lot of coercion within the organization. But this is a minor fact. Now, um, what I liked uh, about the book uh, particularly is that it's very closely uh, related or very specifically driven by the, the very same question I'm driven in my uh, research. And that is also why I particularly liked reading it, trying to understand why, uh, why people commit such horrendous crimes. And naturally, therefore, I try to compare with, uh, with my own work and findings and see if there are any differences uh, between us. Um, but reading the book, I must say there's nothing where I think this is wrong or where I disagree or... Um, yeah, what, uh, what I have a different opinion on. Uh, however, uh, I do wonder some of the things, um, whether you see it similar as I see it or whether you still see it in a kind of, kind of different way. And uh, I'd like to pose you a few things uh, which I think are important and they're somehow also in the book, but not as prominently as I think uh, they, the, their importance is. Um, in my own research, I've uh, focused very much on, on the, the uh, fact that people transform into perpetrators. So they're not born perpetrators, but they transform into perpetrators. Now, what you do mention absolutely is all the different motivations, the factors that, that play a role. Uh, and you do also mention that people desensitize, brutalize, uh, you refer to the work of Irving Staub, the continuum of destructiveness, etc. You refer to Lifton's work on, on doubling uh, as, and mechanisms of cognitive dissonance. But I do wonder uh, whether or not you would uh, agree that people actually transform into perpetrators. So ordinary people, uh, yet change while, uh, while doing things. Um, one of the things that struck me, and I cannot remember that you specifically mentioned that, but that is also what always struck me when reading about perpetrators, but also when uh, talking to them. Uh, I went to Rwanda and talked to perpetrators in Rwanda, is the fact that almost all perpetrators say that they feel bad about their first crime, that they feel, feel horrible. And then this, this mechanism of cognitive dissonance starts to work where they try to soothe their conscience. And while doing so, they rationalize and justify what they did. And then in, in my view, my understanding is that they then end up in a psychological trap actually, because they start to rationalize and justify and by doing so, they, they change. 
And I often make the comparison with the uh, Milgram experiment, and then not so much the fact of that they obey, but the fact of uh, that Milgram started off not with 450 volts as the first shock, because I think if he had done that, that most participants would have said, no, no, we're not going to do that. But the, the phenomena that he started with 50, 15 volts and then increased it each time with 15 uh, extra volt, which makes it very hard for the perpetrators to stop. And uh, several scholars uh, have pointed to the fact that this is a psychological trap because while you do it, you get more into it and then you change. And the, the, the further you get into the process, the harder it is to stop. And I wonder uh, how important you believe uh, that is. And of course, we recently had the, um, the verdict in the Dominic Ongwen case. Uh, what, what is a clear example of someone who actually transformed into a perpetrator as he started off as the coerced young boy who was kidnapped, but ended up in a vicious perpetrator. So he clearly went through that whole process. And um, yeah, I'd like to love to hear your, your opinion on that. Um, a second point that uh, struck me and uh, or struck me where I wonder exactly how you, you feel about that is that you do mention a lot, and I totally agree that the motivations interact with the context and that they're facilitating factors. And I particularly think you did an excellent job in, in relating or mentioning ideology, for instance, both as a motivation and a facilitating factor, but also as part of the context. So I think that is all very good, but you, don't really mention dispositional factors as such. And I wondered uh, how important the role of dispositional factors as such uh, do you think that they play? And I specifically uh, refer to, to characteristics such as narcissism, psychopathy, egotism. Uh, you do mention sadism, um, which is also predisposition. But to what extent do these factors uh, play a role? And I'm eager, eager to hear your, uh, your point in that. And that also relates to the, the biggest difference between uh, the two of us as, as scholars. And that also intrigues me. Uh, as I said, I agree with everything, but your approach is much more action oriented. You focus on an action and a motivation on a particular action. Whereas I focus more on a typology of perpetrators. And what I absolutely do agree that uh, motives can change per action. Um, but I, I wonder to what extent there is a consistency in that factor, which I think is a bit more prominent, uh, or I believe to be a bit more prominent than, than you believe. So, but I'd like to hear your, your, your vision on that. And, um, yeah, two, two or three last final small uh, comments. Uh, what I also wonder, um, reading your work, and that's a question I get a lot from my students uh, and also people whenever I talk about perpetrators, can anyone become a perpetrator? And uh, I think you don't really take position on that in your book, but I wonder what your, uh, what your opinion on that is. And also, uh, Scott Strauss is one of the other panelists. And if I remember correctly, uh, Scott Strauss said in, in one of uh, his works or a, a preface for a book, I think it was, whether uh, we can ever truly understand perpetrators and why they commit horrendous crimes. And I'm very eager to, to hear your opinion. Do you feel you, you can understand them now you've done all this uh, research? And then the very last point uh, is, I also wonder what this doing this type of research did to you. Did the book turn you, uh, well, it definitely turned you in an accomplished uh, scholar uh, by uh, yeah, presenting the book, writing the book, which is great, but what did it do to you as an individual, as a person? Uh, did it change you? Did it affect you? And uh, what do you think can we do with the knowledge uh, that we gained from your book and this type of research? Can we make the world a, a slightly better place? And if so, how?
So I'd love to hear uh, some of your opinions on uh, this. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Alette. Uh, and now we will hear from uh, Scott Strauss. So thank you so much for inviting me and uh, Tim, congratulations on this uh, enormous accomplishment. This is a really excellent book and contribution to the literature and I thought Alette's comments were, were excellent. So I'll try to be uh, quick as well. Um, so I think this is a, a really smart book, a really ambitious book, a thorough book, a synthetic book. And to me, I think the strongest or the biggest contribution here is that you've pulled together a very disparate literature in a comprehensive and careful way into a single framework. And I think as a result, it's this is an excellent teaching tool. It has a great deal of clarity, as Alette said, but it also, while being comprehensive, is very careful in its disaggregation of different mechanisms. So I think there's a mix here of being synthetic and comprehensive and quite careful and specific. And I think that's a very difficult achievement and I congratulate you for it. I think in terms of the theoretical contributions, I, one of them to my mind is the multi-level approach that you develop here, which is to try to find some, some synthesis across these micro factors and sort of, you know, and then meso and, and especially macro factors and how they work together as part of an overall model of, of perpetration. And I think your emphasis on complexity, a concept I'd like to return to at the end, but the, I think the sort of general notion that there are multiple motivations, they change over time, as Alette was just suggesting and so forth. And so I think you're, you abandon a search for the cause of perpetration or the cause of genocide and embrace that there are multiple different pathways and multiple different factors that are going on at different levels. And I think that's, that's certainly welcome. I also think your emphasis on perpetration, and this, I guess, comes to what Alette just said, versus perpetrator is also, I think, uh, is welcome. And I think an important, an important um, argument to make. I'd also say that the, the emphasis on Cambodia is quite welcome. I would say of the you know, major genocides, mass violence cases of the, you know, of the last 50 years, whatever, however you wanna think about a particular period of time, the Cambodia case has not had as much sustained focus as some of the other ones, in particular Rwanda and the Holocaust. And I think the, the work that exists on Cambodia comes at it from a more ethnographic, that sort of Alex Hinton's work, a kind of ethnographic approach. And I think your more sort of, sort of square social science is a welcome addition uh, to the literature on Cambodia. I think to my mind, what this, where I would sort of situate your book in particular is probably a comparison to, to James Waller's book on per perpetrators. And I think this book has some advantages over Jim's book which I also, which I also like. This is not a criticism of, of, of Waller's book. I think it's a. This is yours is a more thorough analysis. A little bit less dependence on the Holocaust. A little less dependence on psychological and psychosocial theories, and I think ultimately more sophisticated in the number of theories it brings together and in the synthesis that it creates. So. In terms of audiences, I mean, obviously, I, and I suspect many people here are interested in, in perpetrators and perpetration and interested in, in genocide and genocide studies. And I think that the book is clearly going to speak to that audience, to people who are focused on these questions as Alette is and I am, and perhaps people in the audience. And I do think the model is quite general. It's one that is, as I said, is very good for teaching, but I think is a very useful framework for thinking about in multiple different contexts. I also think there's here a clear contribution on Cambodia, as I just said, but I think even more broadly, there, I, there are, for those who are interested in violence and political violence, I think, or perhaps even in, in, in deviation or sort of criminal, you know, criminal violence of different types, I think there are a lot of insights in your book that can be used. And even more broadly than that, I think you have a theory of social action and so I think that there, is, uh, there are multiple layers of people who should be interested in, in this book. So I had some prepared remarks on your model itself. I think you've done a really nice job of, of synthesizing it and, I, and perhaps it would take too much time to go through all the different elements, but I think Tim's, the, the graph, the sort of the, the graphic that, that Tim presented, and I believe is on uh, page 43 of the book, is an excellent summary of the overall schema 
and model that he presents. So in, uh, in the spirit of, of sort of conversation, I have a couple questions that I'd love to you know, hear your thoughts on. And one of them has to do with sort of what a model means in your book, right? And, and, and the way you presented it was it's a heurist in just now is a heuristic for understanding how individuals perpetrate violence or come to perpetrate mass violence and a kind of and, and as such it's a, a a sort of way of understanding um, I think the 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 book also presents it as a causal as a model of causality maybe not a predictive model but a theory a, 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 of a type of cause and I think that raises the question because there are so many different factors and mechanisms in the book about the question of whether or not these are Kind of necessary conditions or you know are you going for uh, a, a model that is comprehensive and sort of covers everything or one that really focuses on uh, why you know sort of necessary conditions for a particular action to happen and you discuss this a little bit on pages 56 and 57 and talk about an inus model and and i would love to hear you know i hear i'd love to hear more about that um, so, um, so anyway, I don't think this is a problem, but I'm curious how you think about the work that the, that the model is doing, right? Um, I think the model itself, the theory itself is, again, one of its greatest strengths is how comprehensive and synthetic it is. And I think the concept of complexity here, as I understand it, primarily means that there are multiple things going on in these situations that lead someone to participate in violence. And that when you look at a more abstract or aggregate level that there are multiple perpetrators, there's change over time and so forth. Uh, but I still wanted to hear more about what complexity means. And I think as academics, we often use the word complexity to mean different things. And it can be a kind of, I think a, 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 a placeholder for thinking about the fact that like, it's not simple, right? But I'd still like to hear more about what you mean by complexity in this particular place, in this particular work. Another question is, has to do with the, you know, the place of restraint and non-perpetrators. You discuss this a little bit on, on the book, in the book, but I'd be interested, you know, many of your, much of your model is about what drives perpetration. But I think it's also important to consider what restrains perpetration, or what would be, you know, what would, what would um, cause someone not to participate or to start. I mean, this gets a little bit to a let's question of transformation, you know, to start violence, but then to to stop violence, right, which does happen as well. And so I think that I think I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. The focus of this book is, is as I read it, primarily on low-level perpetrators, the sort of um, the sort of Browning ordinary men type of perpetrator. But I'd also be curious whether or not you think this model applies to the elite level, to the sort of the leadership of those who are who are um, who are sort of often orchestrating or ordering or, or or initiating the violence at this level. A couple other quick questions. One has to do with the work in Cambodia itself. So you did 58 interviews in Cambodia and you talk about some of the biases that many the many researchers who focus on perpetrators face having to do with questions of, of truth telling, questions of retrospective bias, questions of wanting to make oneself look good, and, and Alette talked about this as well. I'd be curious a little bit about sort of sampling and how you got to the 58 and, and whether or not there are any other, um, you know, I think biases that that are important to think about in the question of how we interpret the data that you found. I think relatedly, one question for me is sort of what the place of the data were in this book, right? So I, I read it as you were primarily, it was primarily illustrative, right? That you have this schematic model and then you used your interviews in, primarily your interviews in Cambodia to, to illustrate a particular mechanism or process and so forth. And so it wasn't data that was evaluative, like you were gonna rule in or rule out a particular hypothesis, but rather, rather illustrative. And if I wondered if that was a correct understanding of the way in which you were using evidence uh, in this book. I was really intrigued about the notebooks. You mentioned them early and, and I wanted to understand just more like, you know, about them and, and how you found them and what you learned from them, how they were different from the interviews. And that, that part of the book, I'd love to hear 
more of it about, and also just in general, what it was like to do research uh, in Cambodia. So let me leave it there. I thought Alette had some great questions that I would actually love to hear the answers to uh, that, that she concluded with. And so again, congratulations. And, um, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I both uh, Alex and Scott brought up some incredibly um, interesting questions and key points. Uh, and Tim, you have quite a lot to grapple with. So I will turn this over to you for um, to begin answering some of the questions and to get our conversation started. Okay, great. Um, Thank you so much, um, Alette and Scott, for those really, really interesting questions um, and for reacting uh, and contextualizing um, the book as well. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to have had you both read it and engage with it um, at that level. Um, there are, you've, you've posed so many questions that I, I have the feeling that I won't be able to respond to them all, otherwise I'd fill up the rest of our time. But maybe I'll pick out a couple and then we can just enter into a discussion about those and then hopefully the others will sort of come up uh, in, in due course. So maybe Cassie can just um, interrupt me when <laughs> she thinks I've spoken enough. Um, maybe I'll start with Alette's question um, about, uh, it, it goes on to several of these, these aspects. Um, like Alette highlight, highlighted, uh, different to, to, to her perspective and also many others in the literature, I think that an action-oriented approach is helpful. So um, basically what I, I, I argue by that in the book and also um, in other publications is that what we need to be understanding is not how, why people become a perpetrator, but why they perpetrate specific actions. Um, because uh, perpetrators engage in many different types of actions and the motivations can change over time. Um, at the same time, they can also have motivations to save people at some points in time um, or to not act and be bystanders at certain points of time. So from my perspective, it's helpful to look um, at the actions. Um, but what that does do is, uh, is what um, Alette says, is that it, it makes it slightly harder to look at the transformation processes. I do think that the transformation processes are very important. And um, as Scott also highlighted, the um, I, I do try and make a case for uh, the model being dynamic, but the model itself isn't dynamic. It needs to be used dynamically to understand individuals. So at any point in time, it becomes useful to look at what motivations, facilitative factors and contextual conditions are working upon this person to motivate them to um, engage in participation. Um, and I've done a little bit of work since with Jan Reinermann um, on uh, modeling how motivations change. But we haven't sort of gone that next step further to look at how the entire model um, changes over time, uh, because it's an extremely complex process, as it were. But um, most of the factors which uh, speak to temporality uh, I have as facilitative factors, and they, and that they sort of bring in this dynamism uh, that means that one action does also impact the next action. And so there will be a certain amount of consistency over time. But I think it's this element of transformation and desensitization and how people get used to what they're doing uh, and how the context changes, which means that actually this action oriented approach is much more apt at uh, grappling with that. Um, whereas um, if you look at a perpetrator and their motivations, you'll, you'll, you can model it, but you, in essence, you have to deep dive into certain points in time anyway. Uh, and then it, it makes sense to sort of disaggregate that um, to, to the actions that you're looking at. Um, I, maybe next I can um, say, yeah, I, that's answered a couple of Alette's questions. Uh, and I'll come back to maybe some of the more general ones, um, which Alette called smaller questions, which I think actually are larger questions because uh, they sort of say a lot about uh, how I see the world and what, what I've learned through writing the book. But um, to, to answer what Scott was saying about what do I understand as a model and what am I actually trying to do with this model? Um, 
what it does is it prov a model provides a way of looking at the world which doesn't look at every single empirical detail um, but at the same time isn't completely abstract it's a sort of an in-between that so it it imbues uh, it, it becomes imbued with significance by being used empirically um, so the model itself is, is quite abstract and it allows the different causal uh, relations to be shown, but when then used on a concrete example of an individual perpetrator, it becomes meaningful and those relationships take on um, a certain degree of, um, of, uh, yeah, of significance and they help us understand why the person is acting the way they are at that moment in time. Um, and so from that point of view, uh, it, it means that the causality, the, 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 key, um, the key dynamic underlying or the key point of the model is to be able to see how the different factors work. So the reason I differentiate between motivations and facilitative factors is that it allows us to look at an individual decision and try and disaggregate that and understand what the factors are and what the factors are not. And I think this ties into the other question, uh, one of the other questions that Scott posed, which is, um, does this also tell us something about refraining? And I guess that also speaks to the prevention perspective. Not on, on the, the surface level of it. The book is about, um, why people participate um, and not why they don't participate. But at the same time, the, the argument is that people will don't, for the most part, the moral frameworks within which people are acting uh, and the, the psychological horror of, of doing it and so on and so forth means that people don't kill uh, without motivation. So by looking at it through the model, what we can do is we can say that if there isn't significant motivation um, there to uh, participate, then people are refraining from it. So for many of the factors, it's the inverse of uh, the motivation or the facilitative factor themselves that uh, inhibit people. So for instance, um, a facilitative, one facilitative factor is the diffusion of responsibility. If actions become much more tied to the the actor themselves, thus clearly attributing responsibility for the action to the person, then it becomes less likely that the person participates. And this has a refraining effect. Um, uh, so, and then here again, it's it, it's it's relatively complicated because it, it interacts with the, with the context that it's in. Um, and that's why I find it helpful to look at these these um, specific uh, moments and moments in time to try and deep dive into that and understand it there and then maybe have another deep dive at a, another point in time. Um, I am wondering whether I should maybe answer uh, one more question. Um, uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about Cambodia uh, briefly and then I'll, I'll stop talking. Uh, I realize I haven't answered even a fraction of what you asked, but um, the, the, the Cambodian uh, data, yeah, okay, I'm just checking my notes. So I, I sampled, um, it's not an easy uh, context to work in um, from one perspective because I, different to the Holocaust and uh, to the genocide in Rwanda, uh, there are not uh, people who have been clearly identified as perpetrators through judicial mechanisms. Uh, the transitional justice process uh, has uh, meant that uh, only only three people have been sentenced uh, in connection with the genocide uh, and uh, there have been amnesties. And so there isn't a clearly identifiable base of people to speak with. So the, uh, the way that I sampled uh, people was through uh, snowballing, through knowing a person and asking for references, which didn't work particularly um, well. Um, this is mostly due to the fact that uh, after the end of uh, democratic Cambodia, after the end of the Khmer Rouge regime, many people went back to their home villages and didn't stay uh, in contact. So meaning that uh, snowballing doesn't work particularly well. But the data that I then, that I draw on, yes, its, it's function to a strong degree is illustrative um, in, in the book, but it was also, I selected Cambodia as a case because it's different to Rwanda and the Holocaust uh, in 
in a lot of ways uh, as the two cases which have had the most research uh, done on. And so my idea was that if I go to Cambodia and find the same kinds of motivations, the same kinds of dynamics and the same logics underlying people's participation in Cambodia, then that really strengthens the argument that it's that there's more generalizable dynamics underlying it. And that is what I, I did find. Um, there are obviously differences between the cases, but fundamentally um, it could be explained by um, the same model. And so in the, the book then, I, I present it uh, less as a theory test and more as um, the model and uh, examples and from Cambodia, but the logic of the research de design behind it originally was a slightly more um, ambitious one, but it didn't lend itself as strongly to uh, writing. I think then it would be a book more for political scientists who are interested in a sort of a hypothesis testing um, approach. Um, also, I think that the data that I have, it would be harder to do a rigorous political science uh, book uh, with it because um, yeah, the nature of, of uh, data collected in the field in, on this kind of topic with the bi some of the biases that I mentioned in the book uh, makes that a little bit more difficult. Uh, I think at this point I'll, I'll stop. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so why don't we all, um, I'll ask uh, Scott and Alex to um, join us, uh, turn on their cameras, and we can um, get uh, a broader discussion going. We already have uh, several questions that have been posted in the Q&A and the chat. Uh, and so I think for purposes of uh, time um, management, uh, I might ask a couple, and then the, the panel can uh, respond to those. Does, does that work? Everyone? <laughs> okay. Um, first, I, I want to take a prerogative as moderator and, and ask one question that um, follows up uh, on something that uh, each of you have actually touched on, uh, and that is this. Um, in your book, uh, Tim, you take as a starting point, and each of you have touched on why this is important or a welcome addition, um, but the idea that rather than focusing on um, essentialist ideas of victim, perpetrator, et cetera, as categories of identity. Um, it's important that we look at those as ca more categories of action, uh, I suppose we would say. Um, and so this is something that I have a great deal of interest in and I, I grapple with in my own work. And so I, I was just hoping that the three of you could talk about that a little bit more. Um, the utility and importance of acknowledging that people shift between um, different categories or uh, as uh, Alette said, change over time, motivations change over time. And as, as Tim said, um, you know, people act in a wide variety uh, of ways at different points uh, in time. Um, and so then I will get uh, started on uh, another. Um, so somewhat related, we have a question um, from Andreas Miller. And I apologize in advance if I say your name incorrectly, it's likely going to happen. So my apologies. Um, saying possibly, or perhaps following on from what Alette has discussed about transformation, is this model more relevant for explaining how an ordinary person becomes a perpetrator for the first time? Uh, so how does this model feed back around when we are thinking of perpetrators who have killed many victims over time and space uh, in a conflict? Um, so we'll start with, with those. Uh, who would you like to go first? <laughs> Me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I'll start with the second question. Um, I, d I don't think it only helps explaining the first time uh, that someone kills. I think that that is the easiest point in time because you have less uh, personal history which is modeled into it. But at later points in time, the the, the motivations, uh, the group dynamics uh, within the perpetrator group, uh, the ideological framework of how the victims are being portrayed, um, and uh, the various different facilitative factors relevant to the group, to own, dis uh, own uh, dispositions, 
these are all still important. These are all still um, key to explain why someone will uh, per perpetrate again, um, but it won't necessarily be the same reasons for, as the first time. And that's why I'm saying that I think it's important to look at it from an action perspective because it means that we're forced to look at it again and possibly have different answers. I do agree with Alette that there are um, there are continuities over time, um, but there are also differences. And particularly as one gets habituated into killing, these different, the, the, the continuities and what does change, that's what's really interesting as well. Uh, and maybe I'll briefly uh, un say something to your question, Kasi. Um, I, I think it's really, it's really key to see that the labels of perpetrator, victim, bystander, hero, rescuer, all these are, um, in essence, uh, normative labels. They also have analytical uh, value to them as well. But in the end, people can be multiple of them, but the labels are also used um, for political reasons. And so in Cambodia, most of the people I was speaking to don't identify as perpetrators. Um, they don't, they, they identify for the most part as victims um, of the Khmer Rouge regime. Um, and so I think, uh, and I, 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 I don't really care whether, whether they see themselves as perpetrators or not, or whether I see them as themselves as perpetrators. I'm interested in why they did what they did. Um, so I think from that point of view, I think not having this essentialist conception of identities and seeing the complexities between that is, is quite important. Yes, shall I? Um... Okay, um, yeah, I agree with, with actually all, all you say, Tim, and uh, thanks also for, for the question. I, I do think the transformation process definitely plays an important role after the first crime, but as Tim also said, uh, not only there. I think it plays uh, a role throughout. Um, and I think it's actually well illustrated by one of the examples in, in Tim's book, um, that um, the fact, uh, for instance, that it was said that many uh, soldiers in, in Nazi Germany were actually afraid of uh, being killed if they didn't follow uh, up on an order. But at the same time, no records were found uh, of people who were actually killed for disobeying an order. And uh, Tim mentions what I fully agree with, that the fact that no one killed doesn't matter. It's what matters is the perception of people, that they were afraid of being killed. Well, that is the point um, I make with the transformation process, where I think it is important is the fact that it is fear internalized for a specific consequence, and that can play out for a long, a long time. So an initial fear, once it's internalized, then you no longer have to threaten with anything. And it doesn't even matter that no one was actually killed for uh, disobeying an order, but it's still an internalized uh, fear and, and still plays a role. And therefore, I think uh, that transformation process is, is important. And that's also why I mentioned the example of Dominic Anguen, who were actually who was uh, kidnapped as a child and went through a very coercive training. But even once this coercion was no longer there, and in fact, when he was one of the leaders of the LRA, so he was one of the most powerful people, I think the fear was still internalized and, and, and part of him. So I think there it, it, it does play a role. And now listening more to, to Tim's answer, I, I, uh, and your question, uh, Kars, if on, on action-oriented or uh, perpetrator-oriented, I think we don't, do not really uh, differ that much because we both agree that there are some consistent factors, but we also both agree that there are differences related to different actions. And uh, actually now I become more and more convinced it's merely uh, a difference between us where we put the emphasis on. Tim puts the emphasis on, on the action itself but uh, the, the perpetrator who he is plays a role. And, and for me, I played, uh, put the emphasis on the, uh, the consistent factors, although I absolutely agree, and I don't, don't get me wrong, I don't disagree with that, that perpetrators can have different motives for different actions at, uh, at time. So I think that ties into to just matters where you put a bit more the emphasis.
I don't have a huge amount to add. I would just say that, you know, from my perspective, the literature has really moved away from focus on perpetrators, where, you know, you look at the early Holocaust literature, even when I was doing my work on Rwanda in the late 1990s and early 2000s, I think perpetrator was the main focus of explanation. But I think Tim and others, I think have rightly, you know, oriented us to the fact that what we're actually explaining is the action, is the, is the act of committing violence, not the type of person. At the same time, I think it's still useful to think about sort of characteristics of those who participate, whether we, you know, and I think we can call them perpetrators and, and to understand both, you know, in the aggregate, what their characteristics are. Um, by characteristics, I mean, you know, their age, their professions, their political party affiliation, their education and other kind, you know, where they come from in a particular country. And I think all that is very useful information. And it's useful for understanding what the profile of those who participated was, and also potentially for thinking about comparison to those who did not participate. And so I think the category of perpetrator, I wouldn't say I'm not allergic to it in any way, but I think one of the advantages of what Tim is, and others are doing is to really is to really clarify that what we're actually explaining is perpetration. It's it's those who it's it's the action. Um, so that's yeah. Let me leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I'll go through uh, next round. I'll do three this time. And um, we have a question from uh, Garrett Deezings. And again, I apologize. Um, my 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 Dutch pronunciation is not good. Um, but who asks, can you perhaps explain a bit more the role of emotions as a category of what you call outgroup motivations? Do you suggest that they intervene or insert themselves from the outside, similar to an ideology which may be imposed from the above uh, or crafted by a state or political elite? Um, in a somewhat related question, um, we have uh, one by Tom Konzak who asks um, or says he would very much appreciate if you could elaborate a bit more on how the context affects the group, which in turn impacts on an individual's decision to engage in political violence. How much agency do you attribute to the individual perpetrators vis-a-vis -vis the macro and meso levels? Uh, and then one more sort of flowing from the idea of um, looking at individual perpetrators from Belen Gonzalez says, I'm curious to know if your ordinary men in your interviews are also somehow related to the security forces in Cambodia, and if so, where would career pressures fit within your complexity of evil model um, as a motivator or as a fa facilitator factor? Uh, and I'll stop. Should I go first again? Or oh, I can't. Unfortunately, I opened the chat and it's covering everyone's faces. Uh, sorry. Uh, but the silence I'll, exp I'll like, take to, to, to mean that yes. Um, I, so I, I think I'll start with the second question. Um, the context affects the group and that affects the individual. Um, what does this mean for agency? Um, this is something that uh, in the, the very short blurb that I gave at the beginning, I didn't highlight so much, uh, but Scott did um, uh, touch upon in his remarks, is that for me, the, th the three levels of the macro, the meso and the micro are really key to understanding why at this individual level, at the micro level, uh, people engage in uh, the action that they do. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's not a, a sort of a simple relationship with the context determining the group and the group determining the individual, but because um, both the group dynamics impact back up to the macro level, uh, just as the as individual action over time also impacts the group. And so uh, social psychological work also shows that uh, even one or two people within a, a group um, uh, pushing back against the group decision have strong ramifications for how the group uh, sees certain issues. So there, there is definitely something to be, uh, or I think it's really key to understand that this isn't deterministic. And that also means that agency uh, is 
is a very important category to look at. It doesn't mean that at any point in time people can act in any way they want um, because people are embedded within a subjective understanding of the situations they're in. So within an ideological framework, within a certain coercive framework, I would argue that um, there, are, there are elements of constrained agency. Um, for instance, uh, we see uh, um, Aled has worked uh, on female perpetrators and women do participate in genocide, but they, they also experience very concrete constraints um, through their gender role, which impact how they can act and also impact how they see the group and how, uh, how those, um, those dynamics can work. Um, on ordinary men, uh, yes, um, in fact, uh, all the perpetrators uh, in, in Cambodia were somehow affiliated with the security forces, um, depending on how you define security forces, but it was often um, local militia groups um, and also uh, d detention centers, security centers. Um, and career, um, career factors did indeed uh, play a role uh, for people to participate. It was uh, relayed to me in, in multiple interviews that people who uh, participated actively in killing uh, were much uh, more likely to be promoted, uh, for example. Um, and you could avoid uh, demotion or becoming suspicious uh, by, by participating as well. And I think the third question was on, um, was on emotions um, and uh, I can't remember exactly what the question was. I'm so sorry. I started writing it down, but I didn't write it down as coherently as I, I could have done. Uh, I'm just gonna look in the chat. Um, I can also re-ask. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I'm on the wrong. Can you perhaps explain a bit more the role of emotions as a category of what you call outgroup motivations? So do you suggest that they intervene or insert themselves from the outside, similar to ideology that may be imposed from above or crafted by political elite? Okay, yeah, so um, no, what I mean by outgroup motivations um, is something different. It means that the, uh, sorry, outgroup, um, yeah, motivations, they, they're focused, they're motivations which are focused on the outgroup. And so um, in social identity theory, the in-group is basically the people, uh, your peers and the outgroup um, are, the others. And so in this context, the in-group are the other perpetrators and the out-group are the victim group. So their, their motivations which are fixed, which are somehow generated through um, the victims and the victim identities and the victim presence. So um, here ideologies, it's not because it's outside from the system, but it's because it, they relate to the victims. Whereas all the other motivation and the emotion is the same, it's fear of the victims or anger at the victims or hate for the victims. Those kinds of emotional responses towards the victims, whereas all the other factors actually have nothing to do with the victim group themselves. They're about social dynamics, they're about opportunistic motivations, and actually the motivation for the action doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the victim group themselves. Um, Um, yeah, I only have a, a minor comment because most questions were related actually to, to specifically the, uh, the book or what was meant, but I, I fully agree with what Tim says on uh, agency, that it is important and there is still agency, but that agency is constraint. And uh, I think that is an important uh, factor and uh, thinking further along uh, my, my own questions relating to the, the, the types and, and, and the action, I do think there uh, that, for instance, also psychological uh, factors uh, cause uh, certain constraints. And for instance, you can see that I think in, in dehumanization uh, and also in ideology, once you, you, you start to um, act in a certain context and you start to show certain behavior, then you also start to more and more dehumanize others and more and more hold on to, uh, to certain ideology. And, and Tim in his scheme called that uh, also moral disengagement, which is very, very true. But you more you do that, the, the 
easier it becomes also, but the harder it is to, to get out of, of, of that, um, that constraints that you, that the perpetrators actually also almost automatically create themselves. If you understand what I mean, is that they, um, they, they get a bit trapped in their own rationalizations and justifications, and that creates a further constraint, I, I believe. But, but in essence, and I think that is very important because that is where research on perpetrators, at least I felt that is often misunderstood, that trying to understand people is excuse them. Uh, but I think it's this dual message that uh, understanding is not excusing, but it, it, it's realizing that the context is constrained, but there's still agency in there, but it is constrained. That was uh, what I wanted. Again, I don't have much to add. I would just say that, you know, as I think about the individuals who participated in genocide that, you know, I've studied and thought about for a while, you know, I don't think you can, I, I, I don't think they would commit the actions they committed outside of certain contexts, right? Outside of certain group dynamics, outside of certain broader macro level conditions, outside of certain um, essentially, you know, permissive conditions or orders that states provided. And so, or, or, you know, if you're looking at non-state actors at, at organizational uh, sort of leaders of different organizations provide. And so, you know, I do think that you can, that this is not an individual level story, right? There is agency for sure. And there is decision-making, but this is, for me, this is not a story that starts with individual level motivations, even though we need to understand. And, and I think Tim's book does this very carefully to understand what those mechanisms are that lead individuals to, to participate, but the causal structure of this type of violence is very social, very political, and, and not individually based, in my view. Thank you all very much. Um, the next round of questions really will deal with, I'm pulling from a few, and it, they deal with the, the explanatory capabilities of your model and uh, also with the generalizability or portability. Um, of the model. And so first, um, there's a question that actually came up from two individuals uh, in slightly different ways. Um, but a common question from the Cambodian public is, why did Khmer kill Khmer? Does your book contribute to answer this question too? And if so, what way? Um, there's a second comment that also echoes this question. Um, but then further expand saying, are those murderers consciously aware of their heinous actions, um, noting that it's incredibly important for healing for victims to begin um, when the causes are, are more uh, better illuminated. Um, the second question um, says, or, or the second sort of after that first question set, uh, it says, it's fascinating to see such a comprehensive model incorporating the manifold aspects of perpetrator motivation. Given that you have conducted your research in Cambodia, would you say that your model is distinctively Cambodian or Southeast Asian, or do you see possibilities to apply it to other cases of genocide or even mass violence in general? Um, do you look forward to case studies of other cases applying your model? Uh, and then the third, says your book is about the perpetration of interna the international crime of genocide. Indeed, intentional group destruction against um, the Vietnamese and Kham uh, occurred in the DK. However, perhaps the concept of crimes against humanity covers much more extensively what also happened throughout Cambodia. To what extent does your model also serve as an explanatory model for crime against humanity acts against individuals such as murder, extermination, deportation, torture and persecution. So with that, <laughs> uh, I feel like that's probably mostly directed um, to Tim, but of course, um, if uh, Alette and Scott have any comments on that, um, we would love to hear those as well. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah I'll definitely respond, but I, I do think that possibly uh, Alette and Scott will, will disagree with one or two of the things that I'm gonna say. I'm not, I'm not sure though, but um, okay. Why did Khmer kill Khmer? Um, I, I mean, I, I, 
like Scott just said, the, the book can provide part of an answer as why people participated in that. It doesn't try to explain um, the, the genocide as a whole. So it can't explain why uh, genocide occurred in Cambodia. Um, but it, it does explain or try to explain why individual Cambodians participated, why in, at certain points in time during democratic Kampuchea, during the regime, um, people uh, killed other um, Cambodian people. Um, so I do think, and the factors that, that motivate this are um, uh, embedded in, in, in in, within a larger ideological framework, within, a, in, within authority structures, which were extremely oppressive, a totalitarian regime. Um, and so the, the system of the Khmer Rouge, um, of, of Ankar, the organization of the Khmer Rouge, that it established, to, to be able to explain the individual per, per, uh, participation, you have to look at the system as well. So there is a lot of that in the book as well, where you you, you get to understand how the genocide was structured, how um, uh, those are the background factors because you can only understand how they work at the but it, at the micro level um, if you know a little bit about those. But it's always sort of explained through this individual level perspective. Um, and yes, um, this question of uh, were people consciously aware of their heinous actions? Um, people were aware of what they did, and they and people the way people speak about it realizes also that they they were heinous things they did. But what is very common uh, was very common in the interviews is for people to distance themselves from them very strongly and say that this was uh, that I had no choice that uh, I was uh, I was forced to do this. And within the totalitarian nature of of the regime, this is also an understandable statement. Um, it's then when you carry on talking to them, you on the second or third or fourth visit um, and interview that more diversity comes into the, into into the explanations that people are giving you. Um, but at the same time, people are aware of what they did. And interestingly, it fe part of the heinous nature of the action that they engaged in feeds also into their sense of victimization because they were forced to do these things um, from their perspective. So uh, there's definitely a, a consciousness of that. But at the same time, uh, the model is definitely not distinctly Cambodian or Southeast Asian. I, I mean, it derives in uh, in equal parts also from the research from many other disciplines which were not based uh, on on the Cambodian genocide, uh, on the excellent research on Rwanda, um, and um, uh, it um, and on the Holocaust. So and and other genocides as well. So it's definitely it's it's explicitly meant to be um, generalizable to other other contexts. Whether it's uh, it can be used to explain other types of crimes, um, uh, namely genocide versus crimes against humanity, that's maybe a little bit more difficult. I, I, I mean, I speak about genocide in Cambodia, and I don't just mean uh, the Khmer Krom and the Vietnamese. I also mean uh, the broader population, uh, the political victims of the Khmer Rouge, uh, because I have a, a, a non- uh, legal understanding of genocide, which I think is quite common in the um, in the social sciences, um, which is the eradication of of groups as they are identified by the perpetrators. But um, but yes, these I, I do think the model is helpful for explaining those kinds of crimes against humanity. Um, whether it's useful for understanding other types of violence and participation in violence, I think. Um, Will, will need to be seen. I think that's something which needs to be looked at. And um, uh, I, I had one um, research student uh, who wrote a, a dissertation with me about looking at organized crime and, uh, and trying to see whether elements of the model helped uh, for understanding participation in that. Um, and I think that those kinds of questions, it would be interesting to see whether the dynamics underlying different types of uh, participation in forms of violence uh, are similar. Um, but that's work that would need to be done. Um, yeah, I could, could fully agree that uh, what Tim said, that the model uh, can be perfectly applied to, to other uh, case studies of genocide, definitely. Uh, as Tim said, the Rwanda and the Holocaust, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think there are also strong uh, parallels to, to other crimes and, of course, most obviously to international crimes. Uh, maybe some organized crimes or crimes committed by certain religious sects, there will be uh, parallels there as, as well. 
So that is very, uh, very interesting. I, I do wanted to ask one question, uh, Tim, which actually Scott raised earlier and uh, focusing on the explanatory capabilities of the model. Uh, one thing I'm very intrigued by, where do you put the, the, the genocidal leaders or the leaders of a genocidal regime? Because you, you focus very much on the, the ordinary people, the low ranking perpetrators, but where, do, uh, where does Pol Pot come into that? that I, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. I don't have anything to add. Um, maybe I'll just uh, respond to that directly then. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know is the, the simple answer because all the data that I've used, most of the things, uh, most of the literature I've been drawing on has explicitly uh, not been uh, on genocide leaders, but on these low level perpetrators. But at the same time, I don't think there should be fundamental differences in using the model. I do think though, that there will be, uh, if we sort of aggregate up across many different low level perpetrators and genocidal leaders, that the, the, the factors that are most important will differ. So I think ideological motivations, as in this is the reason people are engaging it, um, and opportunistic motivations uh, in terms of uh, securing power uh, and um, uh, differentiating oneself from uh, yeah, undermining the power structures of others. I think that will be much more important uh, for the leaders, whereas um, the social dynamics, peer pressure, etc., that this will be less important for the very highest leaders. But even there, then in the sort of the, the second level here, the, the, the in-group dynamics will also be important in how you perform. Uh, but I do think that at, at the core, um, the ideologies of, of, um, of genocidal intent will be more important, for instance. Great, thank you. Um, we'll wrap up with one or two uh, final questions. We're approaching uh, 1130 on my end, um, 530 on yours. Um, so this question um, I'll ask on its own, um, and it's also, uh, it's not coming from me, but it's also one that I'm quite interested in. Um, it says, since many years, uh, ge genocide scholars have done away with the concept of evil to explain violence. You have put the concept back into the discussion and indeed you and I have talked about this <laughs> before. Um, why do you reintroduce it and how do you conceptualize evil? It's uh, a question I was hoping not to get. <laughs> um, uh, Honestly, the the, the type the complexity of evil is a is it's it's a, a shout out to the banality of evil and to Hannah Arendt's concept, and seeing that she sort of broke with the with the literature and the interpretations at her time, and I um and so I think that that's really useful. I do not engage with the concept of evil in the in the book. Um, so <laughs> if you're interested in that, don't buy the book for that, um, buy it for many other reasons. Uh, but, uh, but what I would say is that I, d I don't think the, the concept of evil is particularly useful because from everything that I write in the book, I, I, besides the religious connotations that evil have, which make it very culturally specific, um, I think that um, while the actions may have uh, consequences that are evil, what they 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 don't have is because I'm not looking at the perpetrator. I don't think these are evil people. They're people who, at a specific moment in time, engage in really heinous acts. Um, but the essentialist nature of um, of the concept of evil, uh, I I haven't found particularly useful. I do know there is really interesting work being done at the moment on these concepts, and I think that possibly in the next few years we will be talking about evil more in a less. <laughs> it's 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 in there because a lot of books have evil in the title and it's it's it, it's good and and there'll be a more nuanced uh, take on it but for the moment I don't really uh, engage with that concept sorry bit of a a bad answer really or an honest answer at least and while the question was uh, clearly about the the title of the book um, I wonder if uh, uh, Alette or Scott have anything that they would want to add about this idea 
Um, well, not not so much evil, but but it what comes uh, back to my mind is is one of the questions you haven't answered yet, Tim, and 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 relating to to what uh, I think, if I'm correct, Scott said at one point in the preface of of, of one of the books or or somewhere I read it, I think that we in the end cannot really, uh, despite all our theoretical conceptions, really understand perpetrators. Uh, do you feel you do understand them now after all your research you've done and the book you've, you've written? Um, I, would, I, I, I would respectfully disagree with Scott. I, I think that we can understand perpetrators to the degree that we can understand any human action. Um, I think that if we say we can't understand perpetrators and perpetration, I think that's the same way as saying that we can't really understand how people, uh, that we can look at people and their social interactions and the way they do things. But well, it, it's as social scientists, we're, we're, we're not physical scientists. We can't dissect everything to the same degree. And so I think there are limitations, but I don't think that there is anything inherent in studying perpetrators, which makes that uh, less possible, except that it's much, I, I would say it's much harder to collect data <laughs> uh, with perpetrators than it is on many other questions that we could ask, which are uh, more, more every day. Yeah, this is a really interesting question. And, and Alette, I, I think you're referring to something I wrote in, I think the Journal, Journal of Perpetrator Research. Um, and, it, and it comes out of a um, a nagging concern of mine, right? I mean, I fully agree with Tim's social scientific approach, and that's some of the stuff that I do in my own work, which is to say, we should try to understand what the dynamics are, what the mechanisms are, what the motivations are, what the factors are that facilitate it, and so forth. And it's a category of action that deserves analysis, explanation, and interpretation. I'm totally on board with that. It's more at the end of the day when I think back and sort of, uh, you know, when I think about how individuals end up shifting from their ordinary lives to ultimately killing other human beings that they know or that they have no prior reason really to kill. That I think is a very difficult, like that's still very difficult for me to say, like, I get that. Like, I really understand how that happens. And I think we can identify these forces that push them in that direction. But I still think there's something there that we should humil have humility about in our limits as social scientists to understand. And I think that's where my, that's where the, that's where I was coming from in making those points. But it, it certainly does not mean we should limit the analysis or cease from the kind of intellectual engagement that Tim and others are, you know, doing. I think it's really important work. And so that was not, that was sort of more a reflective point rather than a dismissive point, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. So we have about four or five minutes left. So I just wanna run through um, and repeat a couple of announcements and then I will um, turn it over to uh, our panelists for one um, last uh, round uh, of thoughts uh, or comments. Um, first, I, I have links, uh, I posted links in the chat. Um, the ebook format, and, and someone already commented and thanked you for this, Tim. Um, but the ebook uh, of C the complexity of evil is available um, through open access and free of charge on the publisher's website, and the link is there that you could access that. Um, and we invite you all to do so. Uh, and secondly, this talk, um, this book launch, is part of the Perpetrator Studies Network book launch series. Um, this is the inaugural event for that, and there will be more to come. Um, so we invite you to attend all of those, uh, and the link uh, for that is also, uh, I just recently put that in the chat as well. So I, I wanted to, before I, I hand this over for uh, a wrap up, just um, read out um, a part of one uh, comment from someone who had to leave. Um, but she, in addition to thanking you all for the wonderful presentation, uh, said she just wanted to share that as a humanitarian practitioner working in armed conflicts to address issues of violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation, uh, that she thinks the humanitarian community can learn a lot from the model that you've shared and exploring how we could draw on it to augment uh, 
our analysis of perpetrators and looking at broad, uh, violence more broadly. So outside of the academy, um, you know, this, this, this has uh, life and, and great potential. And so uh, I figured I would wrap up my own uh, comments with that thought. So I will turn uh, this over to the three of you for any last thoughts or reflections, um, and we can just go in the, the same order that we have been going in. Uh, so, Tim. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, um, Kasi and uh, Scott and Alette for, uh, for setting this, but also to the great audience questions and the interaction here. I, I would, I, I think the, the final thing I'd like to sort of maybe touch upon is um, the question, I, I saw one of the questions in the chat, which we haven't been able to raise uh, from uh, from someone from Cambodia uh, on a, a question of uh, what would I, me as a, not as a researcher, but as a person, would I have participated? Um, and honestly, and this ties into what Alette asked earlier as well as the big question is like, what has this done to me as a person? And I, I feel the 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 very sinking feeling that had I have been in Cambodia in 1977, I as a Cambodian citizen, I and in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes, I'm pretty sure I would have participated. Um, I hope that having done many years of research on this topic now, I'm much more aware of the dynamics and of how my action can maybe also motivate other people not to participate, uh, and that I've thought about it enough uh, that I would anticipate a situation would maybe act in a different way, but I, I'm, I, even that I'm not confident I would be able to answer in that way. Which is not the most, uh, normally I answer the question is what's done to me, it makes me a more optimistic person because I don't believe in the concept of evil any longer, I don't think it's a fait accompli, I think that we can understand better why people are doing this. So I, I realize I just ended on a bit of a down note when normally my actual, what I take away from this is actually a lot more positive. Um, yeah, as a final note, I would wanted to say that, uh, yeah, Tim's book is absolutely worthwhile buying, so, and reading, so it's a very uh, useful contribution, and um, the, the, the comment you made, Cars, from, from one of the, the, the people in the audience, that it's useful for, for people working in the humanitarian field, what kept me going also for many years is, apart from my own interest in the research, is that after one of my first article, I was approached by a, a victim uh, of the Holocaust who uh, was intrigued by the research and wanted to know more and actually said that it helped uh, him understand what happened to him and distance himself a bit more. And I, I felt that was always a very important uh, motivation uh, for me to, uh, to continue. And I can only hope that there are more people who, despite the fact that we try to understand the perpetrators uh, and definitely not excuse them, but still also helps the, the, the victims to put it in, in a certain proportion uh, as to what happens. It's... Uh, so, so that uh, kept me going and um, yeah, therefore I just wanted to stress how important this, uh, this research is. And, and to Scott briefly, I didn't mean that your, your comment was meant dismissive because I, I uh, understood that, but it's an intriguing question. Can we really understand uh, in the end? And it's also one that you made me think very strongly about. So that's, then it's easy in such a panel to ask someone else to answer it. But thank you very much for being part of this. And uh, I enjoyed reading the book and enjoyed this uh, panel. Yeah, thanks. I did too. And these were great comments that, uh, that uh, Alette and Tim, you made. And it's really an honor to be here. You know, one question I want to just throw out there, just in the realm of like the things we can't answer but are interesting to think about is, what are the implications for thinking about justice and accountability for the kind of arguments that you're making in this book, Tim, and I think others who study perpetrators are? Because if the answer here is that it has to do, you know, a sort of a situational argument, right? It has to do with these are not bad, evil people, but they are caught in a particular situation and have pressures that are put upon them in order to participate. Whereas I think the model of accountability that, that in, in many places, not all places, assumes that there is individual level guilt, you know, and in a place like Rwanda where you have, you know, 
um, a million people essentially uh, who've been tried. Um, so, you know, are there implications here for, I think there's a kind of disconnect between the criminal accountability, criminal justice approach to genocide and the research on the causes of genocide, both at the micro and macro level. And what are the implications for the kind of work that you've done and the findings that you've developed for informing the, the uh, criminal justice side of things? And so um, just, I think a little bit in light of what Alette had said about thinking about how our work, I think has some implications, both normative implications beyond the specific questions that we're asking, you know, same with justice. I think the sort of justice approach to thinking about genocide has certain, had does certain work and for including for, for survivors and victims and their heirs. Um, but I think it would be interesting to think about how the social science work can inform that enterprise. And I think those two fields remain a little bit disconnected or to the extent that our work as social scientists is used in that context, it's used to prove a case, which is I think not really the interesting implication of the kind of findings that you've developed here. All right, um, wonderful. I just wanna say thank you again um, to uh, Alette and to Scott, uh, and obviously to Tim for giving us this book uh, to discuss. Um, and thank you to all of you um, for posing such interesting questions and for demonstrating interest in this incredibly important topic. Um, and so with that, uh, I think we, we wrap up um, with once again, just a huge, um, thank you to everyone. And thanks to you, Carsey, for great moderating. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Um. Alina? Ah, ich, ich kann es einfach schließen. Ne?